Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Zian, and welcome to the Authors Talk Series 1, brought to you by Education Group Sustainability of Brusa, Malaysia. Thank you for your presence today, the audience who are here at the Tetra, as well as those who have joined us virtually via Zoom. Today, we are privileged to have with us Han, who is the author of the book, Once Upon a Time in Brusa, The Money Equation. Han has written for the Starbiz Weekly column, as well as Nanyang Siang Pao. He has also speak on TED Talks on topics, breaking barriers and status quo and rise against the odds held at UPM and UTM respectively. A lawyer by training, Han is also the founder and CEO of his own fund boutique company, Tradeview Capital. His book, Once Upon a Time in Bursa, was recently named as the winner of the best business reading by MPH. Today, he is here to share with us insights on investing with the right mindset. Before I hand over the mic to Han, I'd like to inform the Q&A session will be held at the end of his talk. If you have any questions, you can type and post them at the chat box. As for the live audience, you can just raise your hands and ask your questions by speaking uh, to the mic located nearest to you. Without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Han. Han, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Yan, for your introduction. Uh, once again, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Busa. It is an honor. As a, as a young kid, um, the stock exchanger, yeah? um, Busa has always been a place that I felt very magical. And for me to be able to step foot here today to speak to you all, it's somewhat like a dream come true because I've always felt that I wanted to be a part of the capital markets and at least in my own capacity, contribute back towards the capital markets development of Malaysia. And being in this uh, holy building uh, in Malaysia, uh, it is a great honor. So I hope that you all will enjoy the talk uh, and whatever that I'm sharing today is purely from my own perspective. It may not be the right way, although the title may be a right mindset, but I think Investing is a very personal journey. 
in that everyone have their own experience, have their own ways of doing things. What I'm just sharing is my perspective and hopefully that shed some light on how I embark on this uh, difficult and treacherous path of investing. So um, the first thing is the money equation. Um, when I was approached by my publisher to write a book, actually I was quite um, a notable uh, anonymous blogger. Uh, I've been blogging on the financial markets for many years and uh, close to seven years when, when I was approached by a publisher, but it was under my pen name called TradeView. The reason why I had to use a pen name back then was simply because I was in the corporate sector um, five years as a lawyer. And after that, subsequently, um, uh, I was working for several companies and I have, of course, an employment contract with them where I'm supposed to be working. Um, so whatever interests or uh, hobbies are something that should not affect the work nature. So as a result, I had to use a pen name. Um, <clears throat> so TradeView was the pen name that I used to write. And so the question then came is what book I wanted to share. Of course, I didn't want to just write a book for the sake of writing and it ending, ending up being a, a coffee table book. You know, I wanted to write something that is easy to understand. And uh, simply, I felt that everyone can relate to money. And interestingly, when I pieced it together, uh, the money equation helps me uh, at least uh, succinctly put what I felt and approach the stock market in an easy and communicable way. So the I, I will share simply that how it all began, the idea behind the equation and uh, the seven principles and the importance of understanding macroeconomics team when you invest and finally making an investment decision. So how it all began, uh, I read, ironically it's books. So I know the Busan Knowledge Center, which is uh, when I first visited, I didn't know the archive and collection was so huge. Uh, and I'm very surprised by the number of books that some may not even be available in bookstores today could be found in the Knowledge Center. So similarly for me, my journey started from books. I think that is probably one of the best gifts a parent can give to a child. A toy, after you play with it, you forget about it. It's, it's, uh, you get replaced with another toy. But books, it sticks with you. So these two books particularly was something that stuck with me. When you give to a boy at his formative age at 13, 14, it sort of shaped the idea and the path of interest uh, as he moved along. And at 13 years old, I sort of already knew what I wanted to do in life. Um, when everyone is just still playing, I, I sort of know that I'm interested in business and I wanted to become a business owner. So one book was Jeffrey Archer's Cain and Abel. Another book is uh, Jeffrey Archer's series to it, The Polygon Daughter. So Cain and Abel was a best-selling book and then subsequently The Polygon Daughter. It basically is a fictional story that talks about two persons who come from a very different background, one from very poor, war-torn uh, background versus someone who's born into money and privilege and how they built their uh, business from ground up and become very successful in their own manner. And The Polygon Daughter is about the first women president of the United States. This was back in the 1990s when the book was published. So how did my investment journey actually begin? Um, I graduated from the London School of Economics and Political Science, but my major was in the law degree. So of course, why did I take up law? It was simply because um, a traditional Chinese family, the parents says that uh, you should be a professional. And my maths isn't particularly good. I, I cannot draw. I'm scared of blood. So naturally it ruled out a lot of profession. Then I realized I just enjoy talking. Conversing, I would say. So then I just took up law. But when I entered the university, um, London School of Economics being the hub right in the center of uh, Europe as financial hub, it became, uh, it totally immersed myself uh, in the whole uh, financial capital markets and how it operates the people around it. And interestingly, when I entered, it was during the global financial crisis, the Lehman Brothers. <laughs> and that was when I realized that, hey, I probably took up the wrong course. You know, I wanted to become a lawyer at the point in time, but I realized that my bigger passion was in the financial and capital markets. Nonetheless, I went on, I graduated, I started off a career in Singapore in, in corporate and litigation law. But so what you see the picture there was actually the typical MRT uh, that I took from Tampines to Tanjung Paga every single uh, uh, day. And at that point in time, it's not like today when you go on the LRT, MRT, everyone's using a smartphone, right? So I remember Apple iPhone, the, the, one of the first or second generation was only launched then. And I had two mag magazines in my, 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 
back, one was the Forbes magazine, another was a Fortune magazine. So it was this Forbes Asia magazine that really kept, uh, kept me company uh, throughout my long commute to work. And there was one company in particular called QL Resources that actually got my, became my first, very first investment. Now, uh, succinctly, I'll share with you all this story is that I wanted to learn about business, but where can I learn? Uh, I didn't come from a family of businessmen or entrepreneurs. I do not have relatives who are very successful businessmen where I can go and teach me about business. So I felt the biggest resource for me to learn is basically the stock market. And BUSA being a stock exchange regulates that all listed companies will need to disclose company information, financial records, business information every year in the annual reports and the quarterly reports. So it became like my resource to the world of business, thanks to the regulators. And there was this company called QL. QL, for those who, who are familiar with them, they started off being a surimi producer and they export to Japan and all the other parts of the world. Surimi is basically fish meat, where they make it into like fish ball, etc. So it was started by brothers who came from um, poverty. And uh, together, they started doing what they were actually in their fishing village. Like, that's where they started. And then they ventured into poultry, eggs, chickens and all. But the more familiar business that maybe you all know that QL is involved today is Family Mart. So subsequently, they ventured into Family Mart. Now, why is this QL so significant to me? Because when you do not know how to invest, where do you start? That is the biggest problem for people who wants to invest in the stock market, afraid of it, but really want, not wanting to take the first step, but afraid. So for me, it was very simple. I read the story. I like it. I had about a few thousand uh, uh, Sing dollars saved up, which is not doing anything because the, the fixed deposit rate in Singapore is very low. I just took it, opened an account, and bought QL. And I didn't know anything at the point. I didn't know whether I was buying cheap, buying expensive, buying money. Not. But one reason made me buy was because of the story of the company. Um, there was a line, something along this line where uh, the interviewer in Pops asked the QL founders, <clears throat> you all came from hardship. You know? Why did you name uh, your company QL? You know? He said, QL in Chinese means a unity. So everyone wins. So he said, my elder siblings, uh, they couldn't afford uh, going to school but they worked so that we younger brothers could have the opportunity for an education. Now, today I'm a successful listed owner company. All my brothers, my siblings will get a share in my company. That was what captivated me. I felt that when you come from poverty and you make it, yet you're able to be united, that is a company that I wanted to be a part of. So I felt that the only way I can be part of QL is to buy small amounts of stocks. And this stock became uh, one of the most successful investments until today. Why I say that is because I didn't know much. But every month, whatever save up, I'll put in QL, I'll put in QL. When the price drop, I'll put in QL. I'll just keep buying, buying, buying. To an extent that when the share price finally moved after several years, I had enough money to pay the first 10% down payment for my house. It wasn't a lot of money, probably about 40, 50,000. But imagine it only grew from about 10, 15,000. So that is the beauty of the stock market if you invest in the right company. So that was where my passion was further fueled as I went along. So over the years, my basic premise in investing in the stock market is very simple. I believe in simplicity. So breaking down complex matters into something very simple, relatable, and easily comprehensible. If I cannot understand something, I cannot understand the company, the business, I simply rather not invest. Case in point, cryptocurrency and NFTs. Yes, I may be young. But if anyone who have went through my interviews and, and, and uh, talks, they will know that I'm quite against um, cryptocurrency and NFT simply because I cannot understand it. And if I cannot understand it, I don't think I'll be able to find a justification to put my hard-earned money in this uh, asset class. So over the years, what I realized is that um, after I put in a few matrix of assessment, simple assessment methods of companies, it forms the word money. I mean. Who wouldn't relate to money, right? So what does money stand for? M stands for management. O stands for operational cash flow. N stands for net cash. E stands for earnings and Y yield. Now, this is very simple. And the purpose of my book was also to make it as simple as possible for the layman to understand how to invest. When you invest in a company, you opt to invest in a company with good management. That is M. Second thing is operational cash flow. Cash flow is like a blood that goes through our body. When the blood stops flowing, the heart stops pumping. That is the idea. So if a company has no cash flow, poor cash flow or negative cash flow, that means the company 
is a going concern risk. Net cash, this is an ideal situation, but there are cases where we, of course, see companies taking debt to grow. But generally for uh, discussion purposes, a company that is net cash means that the balance sheet is strong. There is excess uh, capital. And with the excess capital, you can ensure whether good times or bad times or such as pandemic, where the company cannot function for two years due to uh, lockdowns, they can survive. And yield, what is yield? <clears throat> yield is simply the return on investment. So if you bought, buy a property, you rent it out, every month you collect the rent, that is called a yield. Now for stocks, every time you buy a dividend using stock, when you get paid out by the dividend, that is your yield and that is the return on income. So it's very simple, together it's money. Now, apart from that, I, I wanted to summarize it by putting in some principles of investment that I actually uh, realized over the years. So one, number one is buying good quality companies, which will still be around in five years. Why five years? Why not seven years? Why not 10 years? Now, in the past, market cycles generally move from up, pick to throw, back to pick about 10 years. But over the years, I realized that this period of market cycles has been shrinking from five, uh, from 10 to seven to today five. So if you can buy a very good company that can last five years, generally it has since picked to throw. So it's a, a good enough time period for you to assess a company's viability. Now, second is small is beautiful, especially in a time of crisis. The bigger a company is, the more overhead. And the more overhead means that you have more a cost, fixed cost. So pandemic made me realize something very simple. The countries that are smaller generally manage COVID pandemic better. Similarly, in a company, if you are small, not too small, but you've got a healthy balance sheet, you can navigate the pandemic or crisis slightly better. And diversification is the best defense. Now, the biggest risk for investment is you actually do not uh, put all your eggs in one basket. So when you invest, you do not put all your money and fortune in one particular company or particular stock. You must diversify to have a sufficient balance. Why? Just in case anything happens or untoward. Sometimes it may not be the fault of the company. It may be the larger economy or the particular sector. If you diversify, what will happen? You will be able to make sure that you will not lose money. For example, if one stock, stock A performs badly, you still got stock B, stock C to help you to uh, do well. Generally, the rule of thumb is have eight to 10 maximum stocks in your portfolio. That would be good enough because as the more number of stocks, the ratio of a diversification effects get diluted. Okay, <clears throat> and then buying stocks. Now, this is the when to buy. I think even Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger will always tell you they are, they are not capable of timing the market. You will never know what is the lowest price to buy, but you must always pace your entry. So when you buy a particular stock, say at $1, you must be able to scale your entry in prepared, in readiness, that it will drop maybe to 80 cents, 60 cents. So you scale your entries at each level. That way you can bring down your cost gradually over time. Similarly, when you sell the stock, you can scale and sell it upwards. Now, <clears throat> number five, I think it's something that I hope um, today, whoever are in the audience to uh, focus more on simply is to be cynical, skeptical, and always avoid tips. The most common thing during a Hari Raya or a Chinese New Year or Deepavali celebration is that, hey, my friend is a who, who, who at this company. I heard that they will do very well next quarter, can buy the stock. I think everyone has a relative or friend who has said something along this line. Number one rule is always be cynical. Be cynical means that listen and then ask, are you sure? How, why? And then you ask the question, then you remain skeptical. And then ultimately, if I, I would try to avoid tips at all costs. Is the screen all right for the Zoom? Yeah, okay. Can everyone see me at the Zoom? Yes, just to make sure. Is it okay? Okay, sorry guys. <laughs> uh, doing a live uh, hybrid as well as uh, what I have to navigate both. Okay, uh, I'll continue. Now, number six principle is you fear what you don't know. It's normal human nature. If today we put you in a dark room and you do not know what is going on, naturally you'll be afraid. But I feel that fear in itself is very, very powerful uh, emotion. In fact, it is fear that also protects us. In the past, 
Cavemen do not dare to venture out of the cave because they do not know which animal will come and hunt them. Similarly, in the stock market, I don't think it is bad to be afraid. If you are fearful, you are naturally prudent. The biggest problem is that a lot of people are fearless when it comes to the stock market. They are not scared. Okay, So I feel that it's okay to embrace fear and use that as a, your a cautionary tale or advice to move forward. And last and most important rule, and I hope that everyone will pay attention, is that never ever leverage to invest. That means do not take money that you cannot afford. Do not borrow money from people around you. Do not borrow money from the bank. Do not use margin facilities to invest because it's like digging a hole. Before you even make money, you are already subjected to paying interest to the banks and the bank loans or the credit cards or whatever that you use to borrow. That means before you even start making money, you're already negative 5 or 4%. That is the biggest problem. And then you have to overcome that, 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 that mindset to say that, hey, I have to pay this interest at the end of the month. I must quickly make a 4 or 5% return. And what will happen? You dig a deep, deeper hole. Now, what if you lose money? If you lose money, at most, you just lose whatever money that you invested in the stock market. But if you lose money that you invest in and then you borrow some more, you lose the money that you invested, you lose the money that you borrowed from the bank. So that is a very, very uh, uh, risky thing. So there is this uh, uh, public uh, case, the most uh, famous bankruptcy, the richest bankrupt person in Malaysia was uh, the son of a large conglomerate a tycoon, the eldest son of a tycoon in Malaysia. He's bankrupt to the tune of 200 million. So the question is, he's so rich, right? His family is so rich. How can he go bankrupt 200 million? Because he borrowed. When he borrowed from the banks, people know who his father is. So I loan you, no problem. But when it came to the time to pay for the loan, the parents refused to build this type. The tycoon refused to build out his son. And as a result, he died a bankrupt. So this is a very good cautionary tale to everyone. If a tycoon's son, which has unlimited access to financial power and the power of leverage, can have such, such fit. What more retail investors? So I feel this is something that I would like to emphasize uh, one, one more time. I'm just sharing some charts that I've derived uh, from uh, uh, the Bloomberg. As you can see from 87, uh, 1987, if you bought public bank, what it would be today. This is the power of long-term investing. Huh? So this is just an example. I will share a few more companies. I'm not promoting any stocks here at any point in time. I just want to make it clear. But I want to use a historical data to explain to you that investing in the stock market, you will do well as a common people if you build long-term wealth, if your goal is over generations. Now, I will be first to admit to you all as a young person uh, who started investing, I also wanted to make quick money. But what made me change? Of course, I lost money and I realized that it can't be right. Trading in, trading out, trading in, trading out every day and I have to work and I have to monitor the stock market. It just doesn't work. There's no way the stock market is supposed to function like that. So I read several very good books, whether Peter Lynch book, Warren Buffett, books on Buffett and, and all this long-term value investing kind of mindset. And I realized that there's only one common truth and something that is fair to every single human being, whether you're rich, poor, whatever background you are. That is time. All of us are allocated an equal timeline. And time is our best friend. If we can sit on good companies and hold it for a long duration of time, over time, you realize your wealth accumulates and doubles and multiplies without even you doing anything at all, provided it's good company. So public bank is an example. Vitrox is a Penang company that specializes in semiconductor. It's also another company. Shorter time frame from 2006 when it was listed to what it is today, 7x, close to 8x. That means if you put $1, it's worth $8 today. Now, if you put 10,000, it's worth 80,000 today. And how long was it? It took how many years? Uh, 16 years. So this is an example. Uh, or, and, and that is why I say retail investors or common people can invest in the stock market and can do well. Do not always think that the stock market is rigged against you. you know? um, I feel that people who think like that is because they have very bad experience and I do not blame them for it. But naturally, they are Ex examples of opportunities in the market, but they are usually proven over a long duration of time, not a short period of time. This is a Hong Long Financial Group's chart from 1987. It also went, went up to what it is you can see today, less about $1 to about 19, of course, including some corporate exercise, etc. That is 19x, 19 times. So if you put $1, it's worth $19 today. And naturally, you beat the inflation. 
Hata Lega is another company which is a very prominent glove company. In 2008, it was worth how much? How much is it worth today? 5x, it went up. Okay. So, <clears throat> making an investment decision. So, how do you make an investment decision? My book actually is not so much to teach you how to invest because I'm still learning every day and I make a lot of mistakes. Until today, I still make mistakes. But the book serves as a simple guide where the equation helps you get started. You just use the money equation and you think what are the matrix to look at, simple. I do not come from a financial background. I do not have a degree in, uh, or I do not have a degree in finance. I'm not a CFA charter holder. I'm neither an accountant. Um, I'm a lawyer, you know, and lawyer is known to basically be poor at maths, you know. But if I can look at a simple matrix to understand, I think anyone on the street can do it. That is how I look at it. So financial matrix is important because it helps the analysis of data. And if you find it too complex, look at simple things like cash flow, profit, yield. These are very simple numbers that are there. Okay. And the story of the company to me always provides the backbone. I think everyone here likes a story, right? You all watch movies, you watch K-drama. It's all about the story. So find a company that the story you can relate to. For me, QL related to. And then another example is look for a company where you like the founders of the company, the management of the company. You feel that oh, if ever I want to work for this company, I hope that, you know, my boss is someone like him. That may be a company that you want to invest in, you know. So another important thing is to do your homework, groundwork, channel checks. So for example, you all probably work in the uh, oil and gas industry. You have friends in the banking industry. You can always, before you buy, ask them, how is the sector doing? How is it performing? Instead of asking for tips, what, what can I buy? You know, what did you hear? Instead of that, ask them, how is your sales going? You know, uh, what is, is the numbers looking like? Do you think you get a good bonus this year? Ah, then you roughly know how the sector is performing. Now, another thing is psychological health. Now, I'm by far from a psychologist, but there is something that I'll always do when I invest. When I invest in a company, I must make sure I feel at ease. That means I don't invest in a company that I feel very worried, uh, panic, have to check the stock price all the time. Because we are too busy, we have work, we have daily life, we have children to take care of, we have family, you know. So invest in a company that you will naturally feel comfortable and then you can sleep very well at night. And if you can sleep well at night, generally your investment will do well. Okay. So today I, I have a little bit more time. So I will just share a little bit more, a bit of bonus content and talk about some companies um, that have very good stories and also have some good examples or lessons to learn. So like I say, Everyone loves a good story, but make sure you all decipher or dissect whether is it a fairy tale or is it a true story or is it simply comedy? You know, the worst part is you want to invest in companies where the story is actually uh, not true, you know? So Alibaba was a very uh, long time performing stock. Um, in fact, uh, I was quite familiar with Alibaba simply because of um, the founder was a prolific speaker. He goes on speaking circuits all the time. So if you search, Jack Ma, you see all kinds of uh, YouTubes on him. And indeed, over the years, he did very well. And Alibaba really grew. I remember one thing he said. He said, e-commerce is a dessert in US. But in China, e-commerce is a main cause because the infrastructure is so uh, underdeveloped at the time compared to US. So they needed to rely on e-commerce to get goods transacted. As a result, he did very well and at one point became the richest man. Now, what, what is the problem with Alibaba's story then? Doing so well, and why did the share price drop so much in the past one, two years? The backbone of the story is related to the Chinese regulatory environment, the Chinese government. And of course, the business nature of Alibaba has uh, expanded so much that it went beyond their e-commerce core business. They went into financing, providing loans, micro loans, and all. And when you start pro providing micro loans, etc., and you're not regulated by the regulators and financial authorities, what happens is that you start doing exorbitant charges like 18% interest to all your, and this caught the uh, bad side of the regulators. Of course, people say that probably Jack Ma was too prolific, he criticized the regulators, so Chinese government went after him. Yes, that may be well, a small part of the reason, but another part was his business in itself. There were a complex web of um, unregulated activities that were conducted. So a very good story, a fairy tale, but the ending probably wasn't that good. Now today, if people ask me whether can you still buy Alibaba, I said it all depends on how they turn around the company and whether they stick back to their core value and philosophy on how they started the company years ago. Now let's move on to another company, Netflix. 
why I, I chose Netflix is because uh, Netflix is the single US company that provides the greatest entertainment value to myself and my family. Easy to understand, right? You all use Netflix, you all watch shows, you all see, you know, yeah. and that is the story behind Netflix. But what I want to point out is Netflix has a very, very capable management by the name of Reed Hastings. How Netflix started last time was a DVD rental company. You all still remember? They rent out DVDs to, to uh, people. So when you rent out DVD to people, what happens if the world stops using DVDs? You're pretty much dead, right? So there's an opposite company called Blockbuster. That one really went bankrupt. But what did Netflix do? They pivot and they started going into online streaming, content generation. Let's talk about online streaming first. The online streaming that Malaysians are familiar with is basically illegal online streaming, pirated. So what happens is that oh, we get something for free, we don't have to pay. That is the online streaming that Malaysia from. But they actually, what they did was, they actually did a mass online streaming and built up the online streaming market in the US by charging lower uh, fees accessible to the main market that makes piracy in itself no longer worthwhile. That was how they built up. And they didn't stop there. Netflix later on started go into producing contents. They become film producers, movie directors. They started curating contents for their viewers. As a result, they now still enjoy the market leadership. So Disney, Paramount, HBO started to see, oh, this is a big pie. They're taking over cable television. Nobody needs Astro anymore. Sorry, not saying that Astro is not good, but Astro today is working with Netflix. You see? So what I'm saying is that the market will always evolve. So why I net like Netflix, apart from it's easily relatable, something that I use, I like the management ability to navigate and uh, pivot. So share price of Netflix recently has dropped along with all the tech companies. So a lot of people ask me, do I still believe in Netflix? I do believe as long as Reed Hastings is still in the management, I believe they'll be able to get out. Now, as an investor, what do I do? Now, this would become a good opportunity you buy when people are worried, you know? You buy and then you keep for a long term. But that is provided you believe in the business model of streaming, you believe in the, uh, the business model of content generation, okay? Now, MFCB is another company in Malaysia that um, over the past eight to 10 years did very well. Um, a lot of people may not have heard of this company because the owner is very low profile. So, Mega First Corporation, Berhad actually develops a dam uh, build up a dam in uh, uh, to do power generation, hydro dam in Laos, and they sell it back to the uh, concession uh, to the government of Laos, which then distributes power to Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. Why is this something very important? And why is it something that I, I worthwhile to highlight? Because this company, unlike most companies you see in the stock market, whenever they have a new project, what do they do? They announce. Then they tell, I want to raise funds from shareholders. They do rights issue, they do placements, and then you start seeing the share price go down. And then after that, the project does not come into friction. It never happens or the project fails. Then shareholders lost, lost money. So MFCB is a contrary. They had a project in Laos, which is a very big project. Instead of raising a lot of money from shareholders, they did very limited uh, placement exercises, very limited rights issue. They used internally generated funds as well as borrowings to build up their company's base. Then after that, they did well and they completed the project. And now this company has secured a 25 years concession of uh, power generation. And with that, what happens? They have 25 years of net positive uh, to the tune of 300 million in operations cash flow from this project alone. That means imagine 300 million every year just coming in from one particular dam. They have of course other projects and now with the money, they venture to other businesses. So what I'm trying to share of all these three stories have one thing in common. Is the management. Whenever you look at a company, if you really do not know where to invest, how to invest, ask yourself this question. Do you like the founder, the CEO, or the people running the company? If you do, and you believe in them, then it makes your decision to invest very easy. So you see the share price of Alibaba has uh, performed quite badly. Uh, Netflix also have performed very well over the years, and recently has came down. And MFCB, if you look at the price from 2007 until today, from 50 cents at, at its point before bonus, uh, after bonus. Okay. Um, at this moment in time, I think I'm on track. Um, if you all have uh, any uh, questions, I'm opening up the floor to questions at this juncture, or also the Zoom, my, my audience at Zoom. Uh, although I know I'm given 15 minutes to uh, have a q and I'm happy to take uh, more time on this. 
And I hope um, with my little bit of sharing at this juncture, uh, you all will get a little bit of insight into how to start your investment journey. Thank you. Thank you, Han, for your insightful tips. Yeah. Any questions from the floor or our Zoom audience? Feel free to ask questions. Zoom audience, there's 160 of you. Sorry, I neglected you all just now. <laughs> um, I'm more interactive kind of person. So there's no silly questions. Any questions at all, feel free to ask. And especially today, our audience, you know, um, you all took your time out uh, to come here. Uh, I'm very, very thankful for it. So don't be shy. Uh, anything you want to ask. Yeah. Audience, any questions from the audience? Uh, there's one question. Okay, we have one question, Han. Ah, yeah, I so saw from from Muslin. Yeah. Question is how much is the ideal initial fund to start with? Um, I assume the question is then the initial amount to invest in the stock market, how much to start with. I started with three thousand uh three thousand sing dollar at that point in time. So it's about at that point was about uh two point three the exchange rate. So it was about eight thousand ringgit. So now I always tell people that, especially if you want to invest more, any amount is fine. But because of the transaction fees, brokerage, and the hassle of setting up, there's this minimum amount that I always say the rule of thumb is uh, try not to start off investing in a particular one stock less than two thousand ringgit, because below that the threshold is a one thousand or what the, the the transaction fee is almost the same. So two thousand ringgit is actually a very good uh area to start. Of course, this subject your your own uh. Ability, la. do not stretch yourself, do not go and borrow, but 2,000 ringgit is a good place to start. Yeah. Okay, we have several questions coming up. Uh, why you choose Bursa and not Singapore Exchange as a starting point of your investment journey? Yeah. I think this is a fantastic question. Um, and I've, all, I've always anticipated this question and it also written in my book and a lot of my articles. Believe it or not, um, as someone who has worked in uh, Singapore and a uh, number of years and understand the working environment, you know, I've, I feel there's a lot of opportunities in Malaysia. And when you want to invest or make money or do business, you must look at the place where it offers the best opportunity. If a market is matured, developed, opportunity naturally becomes lesser. Especially if the market is more efficient, there's no mispricing they won't see too much of an opportunity to find undervalued. That's number one. Second thing is familiarity. As a Malaysian, there's no place that I'm more familiar than the place that I'm born. My country, my, my, my own stock exchange. The companies are something that I easily drive 10 to 15 minutes. And then later on, I can see, oh, this is the listed company there. You know, I can relate, I can see. But for a company, say, listed in Singapore, I have to probably go to Singapore and start seeing whether how is their point, assuming they're in the retail sector or something that is, if they have business overseas, which is even harder for me to comprehend. So being familiar and being local is the greatest advantage we can have over anyone. Just like if I tell you today, a tourist comes, you bring them around. Aren't you very familiar with Malaysia versus if you are in Singapore? So that's two. Number three, and this is of course a, a more personal side of me, which I'm very happy to share today. I actually love our country a lot. And uh, I consider myself to an extent a patriotic Malaysian. I believe in the potential of Malaysia very much. And despite some negativity that we see sometimes in the news, I think Malaysia has a great potential to become a very, very good country. We are blessed. We, are, we have uh, good resources. We have uh, uh, diversity. And the greatest strength of Malaysia is the people. And because of that, I believe there is always a future and potential for growth uh, for the Malaysia economy. And that is why I also named my book Once Upon a Time in Busa. You know, uh, it is something that I felt that if ever I want to tell a story, it must be something that I feel passionate about and uh, I feel comfortable enough. And I felt this story makes sense. And that's why the book was uh, Once Upon a Time. And that's why I, I started it. Okay, Han, the next question is, what's the reason you are not investing in crypto? Ah, um, 
I mentioned, I think in the second slide, because I only invest in things that I understand. I do not understand cryptocurrencies um, uh, valuation, how they derive the value. I do not understand how it functions. I do not understand how it contributes towards society. So if I do not understand a few of these, it makes it prudent and wiser for me to stay away rather than to incur losses and not wondering where I've gone wrong. Now, if I invest in the stock market and for some reason I lose money, at least I can look back and reflect where my mistakes are. But if I invest in cryptocurrency, even if I make money, I do not know why. If I lose money, I also do not know why I lose money. Now that to me is basically going around navigating in total darkness. Uh, yeah. Okay, the next question, what would you consider before cutting loss? Hmm, very good question. Um, this is the biggest problem with investors. When they're starting to lose money, they do not know when to uh, call it a day. Now for beginners, for beginners, I always recommend a 10 to 15% as the absolute limit for beginners. Now, for a, a, a long-term investor who have some level of experience, I believe that you should consider your time horizon, how long and why. Go back to the question of why you invest in this company. Now, if I invest in a company, say for my, my, my daughter, I believe my duration is probably 10, 20 years. You see? Now, if I invest in this company, it's just for a short-term uh, trade, say six to 12 months. If it starts going against my, my initial uh, uh, confidence level, then I, I will cut. But more importantly, there's another thing as a fundamentalist investor is that as long as the company there's no structural change or fundamental change to the company, the share price can be irrational, but it's okay to hold. So cut loss only if something fundamentally and structurally has changed. Yeah. What kind of investment portfolio would you recommend to someone just starting out their investment journey? Okay. Um, I would recommend you to start off building a eight to 10 stock portfolio. Recommend you to consider companies that are across different sectors. Recommend you to consider companies with certain amount of dividend yield as a beginner. So at least you start off, you test with all these uh, more stable companies with good track record. Whether it do well or do poorly, at least you can understand how it functions. Once you get a hold of this company, then you can start exploring the more um, volatile market segments such as your small, micro cap, middle, uh, mid cap size companies. But until then, until you're familiar with how the stock market operates and you test out your own risk appetite and investment horizon, sticking to the bigger names and those who give you that kind of view is the safer path. The next question is, is macroeconomics factor more important than the company's fundamental? Now, since many value stocks are fall falling now in the US. Ah, okay. Um, I think I just now forgot to touch a bit on macroeconomics. I did take a module um, uh, in university uh, in economics because of my uh, uh, interest. I personally find the study of economics is the closest thing to the study of physics, like in science. Sciences, there are few chemistry, bio, everything, right? Physics is one that you can see, you can feel, you can relate to. You know, why is that rainbow? Why, why does the rain fall? So that's the, the, the idea behind physics. Macroeconomics is the forces is one of the few forces apart from mother nature force that is perpetual and will always ring true. So macroeconomic forces will always affect the stock market, will always affect capital market, and will always affect your daily life. How much does the chicken cost or the egg cost in the, in the pasar today? That is affected by macroeconomic forces. Why is the oil price rising? You know, why is the ringgit depreciating? All these are macroeconomic forces. The problem with the study of macroeconomic forces, it is moving and changing. It's fluid. It doesn't say stick the same from say Monday to Friday. There is a trend, but it may not last over a long duration of time. But generally, if you invest in a good company that can go through market cycle up and down, even the next 10, 15 years, whatever the macroeconomic forces dictate, ultimately it will do well. So what you're seeing in US, this question is that, it is macroeconomics forces of the Fed raising interest rate impacting the valuation of a high risk or risk driven growth stocks that are affecting. And of course, if you look at the value stocks, the dividend using, or those are uh, tied to interest uh, rate hike um, uh, thematic play, generally the stocks perform better. Han, as an investor, what is the one thing that you wish to see in Busa Malaysia? Hmm, this is a, a very good question. 
um, and with speaking in the halls of BUSA today to BUSA employees, I would like to take this opportunity to say that BUSA, you should hold your head high and be proud of what you have done. Especially, we have seen certain very bad news in our stock market in the past uh, one year, you know, with some companies that are doing very unscrupulous things. I feel that BUSA, you must stand your ground. Be proud of your actions, be proud of what you're doing, because as the frontline reg regulator, your role is to protect the integrity of the capital markets of Malaysia. One. Second is that you must always make sure that there is a lot of retail investors relying on your relying on your protection. And these are people who will not be protected. If they if lose they their money, money, they lose their life savings, that's it for them. They are not like banks, they are not like big EPS, quark, or all these institutions, they lose money, they have a lot more to come. The common people need the protection of regulators. So I hope that Busa will not bow down to pressures and make sure that whatever they do, as long as their conscience is clear in terms of protecting the people, the investors, keep it up. And I think Busa has done a good job pursuing cases against fraudulent companies and companies that are not com uh, complying with regulatory requirements. And as long as you all do that, then there is hope for our capital markets development. And today, speaking also not only as an author, but also as a regulated entity, as a CEO of a fund management company licensed by Security Commission, for me to be willing to set up my fund management company in Malaysia is because I believe in the potential of capital markets development. So contrary to what people say, sometimes they say, oh, US is better, Europe is better, Japan is better. Actually, shady and dodgy elements exist in all stock market. Okay, I personally feel that Bursa has done a good job over the years. They have proven and they've done well. And we have actually very good quality companies. As you can see, we saw, I shared a few. These companies will not be able to go up 10x, 15x, 20x if we do not have a very good stock market with proper regulation in place. So I'm saying this not only because I'm in your halls today, but I've always felt that way. It's reflected in my blue and it's also reflected in my title. So if I want to see the one wish that I see in Busan, Malaysia, is that the regulators continue to be firm with their actions, take necessary action against unscrupulous and do not bow down to pressure. Okay, next question. What's your opinion on the glove stock? Wow, is, is that this question? Uh, I, you didn't see it. Okay. Um, I prefer not to answer specific sector alone, but if you ask me my personal view on a, a glove sector, I believe it is a very uh, Malaysian champion industry. It is one of the few that we can tell people in the world that it's from Malaysia and we have 60% of total market share. The company founders of a lot of glove companies in Malaysia are mostly rags to riches. They come from very poor background. They became an industrialist all their life, walking the plant and toiling for 20 to 30 years. They have done very, very, done Malaysian proud in supplying uh, gloves in the fight of pandemic. And I think as Malaysians, we should take pride in Malaysian champions like that. And there are not many industries that we can proudly say that, wow, we're the market leader of the world. So, if you ask me a long-term view, I still believe that Malaysia will remain dominant and will maintain market leadership position even more than China, Vietnam, Indonesia, and other countries that have uh, current, uh, even Thailand for that matter. And if you are looking for long-term, there is no problem. But if you are looking for short-term, short-term market sentiment will always affect uh, um, short-term price movements. I hope that answered the question. Yeah. Okay, we have one comment from Abdul Wahid. Uh, he mentioned his he thank. Uh, thanks, Han, for sharing your insights spot on on Malaysia, your, your opinion on Brusa. How do you decide when to switch to another stock? Any particular tool you use? Switch to another stock. That means if I own one stock, I buy another stock, I assume. Okay. Um, if you have 8 to 10 stocks and you max out your portfolio, try not to add too many. Now, if you have a particular stock that you like and for some reason you felt there is another company that is better, you know, uh, it will give you better returns. Then you ask yourself, within your eight to 10 stocks in the portfolio, which one is the one that gives you the least return after a particular time and which one you feel less convicted. If you feel that particular stock, you are not so, uh, you don't believe as much in the stock, then you can use that opportunity to sell it and switch to another stock. But do not keep switching because the problem with beginners is that after they cannot make money from a particular stock in three months, they switch, switch, switch. And you realize that in the end, the transaction fee 
and then the cost of brokerage that you pay all is even more than whatever profits that you have derived from the initial investment if you were to stay on. So switching is something that you have to think very carefully. Think of it just like property. If you invest in a property, you are okay to hold it for three to five years and all. Will you keep switching property? You wouldn't because it's difficult to change, right? You've got to get lawyers, you've got to get uh, banks and then you've got to go through the whole process. But stocks is easy. You just buy, you just sell. It's like in the market. So it makes it quite simple for you to uh, switch. That becomes the problem for retail investors. Okay. Uh, next question is, what's your view investing in unique trust versus directly in stock market? Okay. Um, this is a very good question. Uh, the unit trust industry in Malaysia is quite mature. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, there are a huge number of money for passive investors are part in unit trust. Uh, personally, how I feel is unit trust serve a particular purpose. The purpose is to cater to people who are not savvy in terms of investing and lazy to invest. It's not a bad thing. If you are not willing to spend time to do homework or you're too busy with your work, let the professional fund managers manage for you. It is their role and their job. Of course, you pay them a certain fee. Uh, there's the, the expenses there. But it's always good to let the professional take care of certain things. Of course, I always liken this to the gardener. If you have time, you want to take care of your garden. You want to plant a tree or bonsai or you put fertilizers. You, know, and you have to make the effort before you can see the results. The problem is a lot of people don't have that time. So what do you do? Do you rather not do it at all and leave the grass to grow wildly? Or do you engage a gardener? The logic is exactly the same. It's okay to spend a little bit of money, engage the gardener to come in to manage if you do not have the time, rather than to not do it at all. So my personal take is always try to put an allocation of your money in the stock market. However little, it can be 5,000, it can be 10,000, as long as you feel that you've got extra cash, you want to put it. So buy something that you like, put it there and see what it does for you over time. And if you cannot do it, for whatever reason, whether compliance reason, because you're working in a regulatory body, you know, it's troublesome to go to tell the compliance department that I'm buying this stock or that stock, then you engage your unit trust, put your money there, let them do it. And there's one particular unit trust that I would like to highlight to uh, investors is that there's the PRS scheme. If you invest in unit trust that is tied to the PRS savings, what you can do is actually um, get tax deduction from the government. So for that one, you every year just need to pay 3,000 and you get tax rebate. So that is something that I feel is quite good, you know? And that is a way to manage not only your finances in terms of long-term investment, but you also get tax breaks from the government. So that is the way of government encouraging people to put money unit trust. So my personal unit trust investment, to be frank with you, 90% uh, of my investment, I do it myself. A small percentage I put in this PRS unit trust just to enjoy the tax benefits from the government. Okay, Hon, before I go to the next question, I would like to acknowledge that our chairman, Tan Sri Abdul Wahid, actually attended the talk and the oh. earlier com comment was from him, Abdul Wahid. Oh. So yeah. apologize, Tan Sri. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> okay. Tan Sri, good to, good to see, that, see you listening to my talk. I hope I, hope I, I said everything all right. <laughs> Okay, uh, Okay. we have a question on your book. Uh, there, there is a question from yeah. Ming Soon yeah. asking, will there be a second edition of your book? And could you include a chapter like how to read financial statement for laymen? Okay, um, I, I've been, I mean, my publisher wants me to publish another book because um, to my surprise, it did very well. Um, it was the best seller in 2021 in a business book. I always joke, lah. thankfully, Tun Mahathil and... Uh, uh, um, Tanshri Nazir Razak's book wasn't in the same category as me. <laughs> if they were in the same category as me as a business reading, I don't think I would, I would win. So I have to thank the, 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 the bookstore also for segregating them to general reading. Now, jokes aside, um, I think I'm at a stage of my life where um, I had the opportunity to write a book simply based on the past 10 years. But I feel that the next book probably will only come 10 years later or 15 years later, simply because when you want to write something, you want to write, you do not want to write for the sake of some uh, uh, writing. You want to write based on experiences that you have accumulated. So I feel that there are market cycles, there are, there are, there are journeys in life that I have to still embark on. And, and an example would be, before this, I was working for people. Today, I own a, my own fund management company and I'm running my own company. Who knows, 10 years later, I will write a book about how I invest my clients' money. 
you know, and share the stories of building up a fund management practice, a company practice in, in Malaysia. So long story short is, uh, I will take note of what you have hoped that I would include, but there are many good authors in Malaysia, apart from myself. And I hope to use this opportunity to also shine light on other authors because being a local author myself, it is very difficult, very, very, very difficult because you do not make money from writing a book. This is number one. So contrary to uh, popular belief, New York Times bestseller, J.K. Rowling, all these are exceptional individuals. They make a lot of money, they become billionaires. I'm far, 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 far from it. Local authors write with a, a mindset of giving back. It's an altruistic endeavor. It takes up a lot of time. I spent three to four hours every single night while my child was still young um, in 2020 just to complete a book for four months. You know? So what I'm trying to say is that give other authors a chance, especially local authors. A lot of content that they share is very relatable, much more than foreign local authors. So when I actually won this and beat out some foreign authors, uh, a lot of them told me, oh, thank, thank, thanks for doing this for Malaysian. Actually, I'm trying to say that local authors have lessons and values and viewpoints that you can actually directly relate to and learn from compared to foreign authors. The content may not, may, the, the, the theories and all from the foreign authors may be quite good, but the content may not be applicable in a local context. So give other local authors a try, and there are many good books, whether in MPH, Popular, Kino Kuniya. Spend some time, just try to give Watan Malaysia a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, what is the standard market return? What returns can I expect? Hmm. Uh, from uh, if you invest in the stock market? Yes. yes. Ah, okay, I thought if I'm, uh, if I'm managing your money. <laughs> okay, uh, okay. Um, generally, the rule of thumb is this. Whatever the deposit, fixed deposit rate in the bank, if you can derive a double of that amount. So if the fixed deposit rate is 2.5%, you can get 5 to 6% per year. That is the rule of thumb. That is already a good investment return. Mm -hmm. So if the so, uh, if our bank Negara Malaysia is going to hike the interest rate to 4%, uh, 4% then 8% return is good. That is the rule of thumb. Anything above is a bonus. That is a good year. You should take the extra money to go and celebrate with your family. That is what I'm trying to advocate. That's why it's not hard if you manage your expectations of returns. But if you want 100% return a year, 20% return per year, it is not easy. The greatest investor of all time, by leaving it, the greatest investor of all time is Warren Buffett. He compounds 20% per year for six decades. So that is why he's a legend. Now use that as a benchmark. If you can get 20% return, you are like a legend. That's what I'm saying. If someone tells you that today I put a money and I get 100% return, or I guarantee you you can get this return, be careful. It is definitely mostly a scam. Mostly a scam. You know? So this is, this is the, the, the opportunity also I would like you to share. Do not get um, sucked into the whole idea of fast money, fast return, winning for. It really is so easy. No one in the world needs to work. That is the, 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 the logic. And the only possibility that you can ever get is if you strike a lottery, you see? But we know the percentage of lottery we know. Okay, uh, there's a question here. Uh, hi, can we watch back the recording? Yes, uh, Sun Ching. We will be uploading uh, this uh, Hans talk onto our Prusa Academy website. You can maybe log on to the video later on. Uh, the next question is, thanks for your responses, Han. How do you feel about robo-advisors like Stash Away? <sighs> okay, the questions are getting harder. Uh, luckily, it's one o'clock already. Okay, uh, okay. I'll answer this, this question um, with uh, my objective opinion. I hope you all take it with a pinch of salt, meaning that everyone has different viewpoints. So do not use what I say as an absolute truth. Okay. Robo advisory serve a very particular niche, meaning because of the advancement of technology. So there are these uh, programs and algorithms that help to manage money. Because in the past 15 years, there was this talk that said active fund managers cannot beat the market. Might as well, we just have robots and algorithms to manage the funds of people. Now, uh, 
I do not agree that active fund management performance has been down, uh, but I do, I do agree that a lot of active fund managers are more like a benchmarker. The reason is not of their own fault. Sometimes it's because they are, like all of us, we've got KPI when we work. The boss say, uh, if you don't beat the benchmark by a certain percentage, you won't have bonus and increment or promotion. So it affects their objective opinion to take, say, a long-term position. If they were to take a long-term investment horizon, generally fund managers will beat the market trends down. But because of a short time frame, six months, eight months, 12 months to deliver returns, so then it affects and impairs their judgment. But if you talk about robo-advisory and coming up with algorithms, the question is always who comes up with the algorithm? It is still human. It is still the people. So whether it is stash away or which, whichever robot advisory out there, there are still people behind it. And these people that are managing it, they must also have certain qualification and capability to do well. Robot advisories is a trend because they make it easy for you to put your deposit in and, and then invest. So ultimately, it all comes down to what fund you put into, which fund manager is managing, what are the algorithms that are being used to manage. And for me personally, I prefer to manage my own money. So why? It's simply because uh, I feel that I have uh, more trust in my own ability to navigate it. And of course, similarly, I don't have that kind of uh, worry that if someone or something goes untoward, I will lose that, that investment. If I lose it, might as well be me. <laughs> that, is, that is just my personal view. What's the fund requirement to engage a company for investment? Uh, I, I think this is not the right platform uh, uh, to do this. Um, uh, I think uh, can we, we can Mr. have a different uh, conversation on a different occasion. But uh, generally, uh, uh, whatever information on my own fund management company is on the website uh, and, and my contact uh, will be shared uh, slightly, slightly later. But that, that will be a, a topic for another day. Mr. Han, do you mind sharing your performance return for us to have a realistic expectation? Yeah, I would recommend you to have a look at my book. Um, there is a page in it, I forgot which chapter already, that states my past five years' performance. Yeah, actually, I'm using the opportunity to promote my book. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we have one last question yes. here. Yeah. How often shall we check our portfolio value for us who are so busy? Your advice, please. Okay. Um, this is based on what Warren Buffett say, lah, huh? not I say. Warren Buffett say, if you invest in the company and the stock market closed for the next five years and you have no problem with that, then that is a good company to invest. So if you invest in a good company, if you don't check it for five years, you know, it's okay. You know, the only problem is you listen to tips and they tell you next month it's going to go up and every day you're looking at it. That becomes a problem. And ultimately, it is somewhat akin to gambling, right? So what I'm trying to say, I'm not saying that don't check your portfolio five years. I cannot, even I cannot do that. Yeah. You of course must know how your, your stock is performing. How that is a, a, a responsibility that you owe it to yourself for putting money in the stock market. But try to avoid uh, checking it all the time such that it impacts your daily life. Investing is supposed to be fun. When it starts becoming a chore, you won't enjoy it and your performance won't be good. I personally, when I invest, I always think this will be for my children's education fund. This will be for my, maybe uh, when I'm a bit older, I do not have the capability to work anymore. I have something there. And every year I just enjoy the dividends that I collect or, or whatnot. Of course, sometimes I take certain shorter term positions for a variety right. of reasons. Uh, but generally, it's always for a longer game. And this hit me even more when I had my child, when I had my first child. And I realized that that totally changed my perspective in terms of the duration. Last time I felt one, two years is a long time. Now I can put money for 20 years and it's fine. Yeah, because that's how long it takes for my children to go, grow up. So, um, Okay, we yeah. have a message from uh, our chairman, Tan Sri Abdul Wahid. Yeah. Yeah. He says, Selamat Hari everyone. Ma'af Zahir Batin. Good talk by Hang. We learn new things every day. For Brusa Malaysia staff, please make sure you comply with our code of conduct ethics when investing. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for your attendance and your questions and participating in our first author talk series one. So tune in to our next uh, author talk series two in June. And if you're interested to read Han's book, 
the book is available at our Knowledge Centre, Brussels, Malaysia. If you are not yet a member of our library, our Knowledge Centre, you can become a member and you can uh, borrow uh, Hans' book and many other books that is available at our library. So, okay, take care and bye -bye. wish you all a pleasant day. Thank you, Hans. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.